Uh, if you are here for the very first time or you are watching us online for the very first time and you do not have a home church, then we want to say to you, Welcome home. Amen. Hey, this morning we uh, have started our soft launch. It's our soft launch for our Embrace Ministry. Two weeks from today, we kick off the celebration of our Embrace Ministry. We've been talking about this for months, and we are finally here. So today is actually a soft launch. Uh, for uh, kids with special needs who are in our Embrace Ministry right now. And so we're really excited about that. But in two weeks from today, we're going to be having a big celebratory time of our Embrace Ministry. So I just wanted to let you know, if you or you know of someone that has a child with special needs, then we have a ministry here for you. There are there are lots of families in our own community right here in Patterson who have children with special needs, but they don't feel like that they have a church family that they can be a part of because there's not a program for them. And so we started this about 12 years ago at our Turlock campus and are now able to offer it here at our Patterson campus. We're really excited about that. Ms. Vernette's been working really hard to get our Embrace program together. And so two weeks from today is our uh, grand opening. It's going to be a big celebratory uh, party for that. But uh, today is our soft launch. So uh, just to cut, we wanted to put the word out. We're going to be putting things on social media too uh, to let people know that if they are in our community and they want to attend a church, um, and they have a special needs child and don't feel like that they can do that, they have a respite here at New Life Patterson, okay? Hey, well, this is the summer, and we've been talking about this for a couple of weeks, that every summer we invite some of our other communicators uh, from our Turlock campus, uh, Pastor Brian and Pastor Brett and Pastor Tommy and pra Pastor John, Pastor Dave. Uh, we're all going to be taking turns rotating campuses uh, this summer. So we're talking about Tales of the Kingdom, the parables of Jesus. And this morning, Pastor Brian is here from our Turlock campus. Let's welcome Pastor Brian. Pastor Brian is the uh, student ministries pastor for our Turlock campus. And so I just want to say a prayer over him because I know that what God has given him uh, for the people here is going to be amazing. So if you will, just uh, uh, bow your heads. We want to pray over him real quick. Heavenly Father, thank you once again for my brother. Father, I thank you, Lord, for the words that you have already inspired in him and through him for your people this morning here at our campus. And I pray, God, that they will just find their way into our spirits, into our souls. They will take root. And, Father, that we can walk away knowing, uh, learning something, God, and knowing, God, that our identity in you. And also, um, Father, the parable that he's going to share, Lord, may we find the character that we associate with and which way that we need to go, which is to run towards you. We thank you, Lord. We ask all this in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you, Brian. Amen. Thank you, Pastor Jeremy. Hey, if you have your Bibles, we are going to be reading out of Luke chapter 15, and we're going to stay there the entire morning. Uh, and when I say the entire morning, I mean it because uh, this is going to be at least a three or four hour gig before we cut you loose. No, I'm just teasing. Uh, Luke chapter 15 is where we're going to be reading out of today. Uh, we are continuing on in our series, our summer series, Tales of the Kingdom, a series like Pastor Jeremy was saying, that we, where we look at some of the parables that we find in the Bible, and then we look for the lesson inside of that parable, and then the challenge, obviously, is to be able to apply it to our lives and our walk with God. So what exactly is a parable? Let's remind ourselves. Uh, parables are fictitious stories that were true to life, um, and they were told in a vivid and fresh way, and their point was to grab the listener's attention and to be able to help them relate or to understand like, oh, okay, I know what Jesus is talking about. And a lot of times he would use these lessons to be able to teach some very pointed life lessons for folks to apply to their life. Uh, somebody told me one time, and it kind of stuck with me, that parables were almost like once upon a, tori, once upon a time stories that, that Jesus would use. Uh, Jesus taught in parables a lot, uh, and each time that he was teaching a parable, he was speaking to a specific audience, so directly to a group of people. Uh, sometimes he was speaking to the Pharisees, then teachers of the law. These We're going to talk more about them in just a second. Um, and, and he was trying to tear down the walls uh, th that they had put up because they had this real self-righteous attitude that, 
they were getting it right and everybody else was getting it wrong. A lot of the parables in the Bible, Jesus is speaking to them. Uh, Jesus used parables to teach his disciples, to remind them that, that the kingdom of God was for everybody, both Jew and Gentile, and that they needed to include all of God's people when they were out being ministers of the gospel. Um, and then there was times that Jesus' parables were directed to the folks that were in the crowd, the folks that were following him from place to place, listen, listening to his teachings. Uh, and he used these parables to just tell them what the kingdom of God looked like and to remind them that they mattered and that they were worthy of God's love and what God was calling them to. Um, as we jump into another parable today, I challenge you to read between the lines. That's what I love about this series. That's what I love about those parables that we find in scripture is that there's always a story inside the story. So read between the lines. Consider uh, the group of people that he is speaking to. Look for the lesson and then try to put yourself in that environment and be able to apply that lesson to your own walk in your own life and your own journey with Christ. And so we're gonna dive in this morning. But first, have you ever been a part of a party or a get together where the invited guest list um, just did not mesh very well together, right? This side of the room and that side of the room, we don't know why they got invited to the same place, why they're all here, but there's stares and there's glances and there's murmuring that is taking place. That's exactly what is going on in Luke chapter 15. Jesus is in a room full of people. Uh, on one side of the room, you have guys from this side of the tracks. Uh, Luke refers to them as the Pharisees or the, the, the tax collectors. And then he identifies a group of people and simply just calls them sinners. So you've got sinners and you've got tax collectors. On the other side of the room, you have Pharisees, okay? Pharisees and the scribes and the teachers of the law, okay? These people were the uppity ups. So let me just, because it's so important, let's break this down. Tax collectors, they were a despised people. They were hated by everyone. Uh, and it's because of the fact that their job was to go and collect taxes. But what they were doing was when they collected taxes, they collected a little bit more than the law required. And then they pocketed the money for themselves, the extra cash. And they were getting rich off of their own people. And folks hated them because of that. They had no place to call their own. They had no place to lay their head. They did not belong to anything. People would rather they be dead. They were despised. And then you have this group of people that Luke just simply refers to as sinners. And I can only imagine, we're all sinners, we understand that, but I can only imagine that the folks are, that are in that room on that in particular day were, I, I bet their reputations preceded them. I, I bet that everybody knew the kind of life they were leading, the decisions they were making and the things that they were up to. Uh, they're in the room. And then the Pharisees, those guys are a religious group of men that thought that they were better than everybody else. Uh, they were more educated than everybody else. They studied harder. They knew the scripture better than everybody else. They were the religious elite. But in their mind, God and, and a relationship with God wasn't for everyone and only the best of the best need to apply, right? And so they would look down their noses at anyone who wasn't as smart or as educated or checked as many boxes as they checked because they thought that a relationship with God was only for the elite. Those are the folks that are in the room. And that's what is happening as we get to Luke chapter 15. And so uh, at some point in the get together, the Pharisees, constantly looking at trying to throw dirt, throw shade at, at Jesus. The Pharisees are, are trying to prove to everyone that Jesus is a liar, that, that he isn't who he says he is. And so every opportunity they get, they're throwing dirt at him. They're trying to disprove or discredit him. And in this conversation, in this gathering, one of the Pharisees takes a jab at Jesus and it's found in, in, in Luke chapter 15, verse two. Uh, and it says, uh, it says, this man welcomes sinners and eats with them. And, and again, it, it's a real backhanded comment. It's like, who is this guy? He, he says he's the son of God. He says he's the chosen. He says he's the Messiah, but yet he spends his time with sinners and he eats with them. 
Jesus responds to this statement with three back-to-back-to-back parables, systematically driving his point home. He's teaching a lesson to anyone in that room who has ears to hear. He starts in verse three of chapter 15 with the parable of the lost sheep. He says, suppose one of you has a hundred sheep and loses one. Doesn't he leave the 99 and go and look for the one? And then seamlessly in verse eight, Jesus moves to the parable of the lost coin. And he says, suppose a woman has 10 coins and loses one. Doesn't she light a lamp, sweep the house, and search carefully until she finds the one coin. I love the progression here. Are you reading between the lines, right? There's always a lesson in the lesson. Jesus says he starts with this progression of one in a hundred is lost and is worth looking for. And then he breaks it down even further and he says, and one in 10 was lost, but they were worth searching for and sweeping the house until it was found. And then he he gets even more personal and he goes from one in 100 to one in 10 to one in two. And Jesus then seamlessly moves into this parable, quite possibly the most popular, the most powerful parable of all times, the parable of the lost son. We're gonna read it together in Luke chapter 15, starting in verse 11. Uh, And this is where we're gonna stay for the rest of the morning. Jesus continued, there was a man who had two sons. The younger one said to his father, Father, give me my share of the estate. So he divided his property between them. Not long after that, the younger son got all he had to get, got together all he had and set off for a distant country. And there he squandered his wealth in wild living. Uh, Over the course of the next several verses, Jesus tells the story of a son who decided to do things his way. He wanted what was owed to him now. He didn't want to submit to the father. He didn't want to submit to the father's ways. He insulted the father by asking for his inheritance early, putting his needs and wants over the father's desires. And then he left home and left to his own accord. He he ends up blowing the entire inheritance on what Luke calls wild living. Uh, As the story continues, uh, a famine strikes the land and the son goes from bad to worse, from desperate to extreme in a matter of a heartbeat uh, because of this famine. And he is looking for anyone to be able to hire him and give him work. Uh, Jesus tells the story that he takes a job feeding a man's pigs. Now, this isn't fluff. This isn't filler. This isn't, you know, accidental. It's absolutely put in the story on purpose because to a Jew, pigs were considered unclean. And so this prodigal son, this lost son has to find work and he finds work feeding a man's pigs. And so not only were they unclean, but now he is even more unclean and more unworthy because he's working with pigs. And then Jesus takes it one step further. Remember, nothing is accidental. There's no wasted words. Jesus takes it one step further and says, because of the famine and because he was so desperate, so hungry, that he considered eating the food that he was feeding to the swine. To everyone in that room that day, this kid is the lowest of loves. And Jesus is painting this picture, right? Then in a moment of clarity, the son has a change of heart and decides to come back and beg his father for mercy. Let's pick it up in verse 17. It says this, when he came to his senses, this is the son, when the son came to his senses, he said, how many of my father's hired servants have food to spare? And here I am starving to death. I will set out and I will go back to my father. And I will say to him, father, I have sinned against heaven and against you. I am no longer worthy to be called your son. Make me like one of your hired servants. Now, As we get to the heart of this parable, let's take a step back and let's remind ourselves of exactly that. This is a parable. So many times we get so wrapped up in the story of the younger son and the older son and the father did this and and we kind of, we start to kind of fall into this trap that it's like, this is a real thing. This isn't a real thing. This is a real to life story that Jesus is using to teach the people in the room. And what I want you to do this morning, I think the most effective use of your time is to focus on that room this morning. Think of who's in there listening intently to Jesus' story. There's sinners in the room who have done things their way and um, life hasn't turned out exactly how they wanted. 
There are tax collectors in the room who are despised and don't belong to anything and have no place to lay their head. They don't feel connected. They don't feel like a part of their own community. Because of their own greed, because of their own desires, they are now exiled from everyone and everything. And then you have this this group of religious uppity-ups that are looking down their nose at everyone in this room and the son in the story. And they 100% believe that this son is getting exactly what he deserved. In fact, I can only imagine that the Pharisees in the room are thinking, finally, Jesus is actually teaching a story to these lowlifes that, hey, when you do things your way, you get what you deserve. And so at this point in the story, they're nodding in agreement, going, yeah, he made his bed, let him lie in it. All of these things are taking place and Jesus has their attention and he's about to drive home this lesson in verse 20. And this is what it says. So the son got up and he went to his father. But while he was still a long way off, his father saw him and was filled with compassion for him. He ran to his son, threw his arms around him and kissed him. In verse 21, the son said to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and against you. I am no longer worthy to be called your son. Take note here that this prepared speech that he was going to give the father, the father only let him get about halfway through it before he interrupted him. And in verse 22, the father interrupted him and said, but the father said to the servants, quick, bring the best robe put it on his, and put it on him. Put a ring on his finger, put sandals on his feet. Bring the fattened calf and kill it. Let's have a feast and celebrate. For this son of mine was dead and is alive again. He was lost and now he's found. And it says, so they began to celebrate. If you're taking notes today, I want you to write this down for point number one. The first, the most powerful life-changing message that Jesus wanted every person in the room that day and every person in the room today to hear was this. The father was looking. Did you, did you pick it up? Did you pick it up in that scripture? Did you hear it? It says in verse 20, so he got up and he went to his father. But while he was still a long way off, the father saw him. The son insulted his father. The son humiliated his father. The son said, you know what, dad? You're better off dead to me, so just give me what is owed to me now because you're better off dead than you are alive. Just give it to me and let me go do my own thing. Humiliation, regret, pain, sorrow. The father could have easily written the son off and said, well, if he wants to do that, let him go do it. I mean, we all have either people in our own family or people that we're close to that have walked through something like this personally. You made your bed. You made your decision. But the scripture says that the father was going about his business, but he had one eye on the horizon. The father was looking for the son. And then when the sun came up over the horizon or started to come down the road and the father could make it out, the father ran to the sun. He didn't wait. He wasn't standoffish. He didn't have this attitude that was like, uh, well, let's see what happens next, right? He, he didn't let the sun come to him. Instead, he dropped whatever he was doing and he ran to the sun. Scripture says that he had compassion for his son. Listen, if you can, highlight, circle, underline that word compassion. The father could have felt resentment for his son and it would have been justified, but he didn't. The the father could have been hurt by the son's actions and the son's abandonment and it would have been justified. He could have felt an unhealthy sense of pride and arrogance, almost like, well, well, look who comes crawling back. I've been there. You have too. But he didn't. Instead, the father, our father, remember, it's a parable. Jesus is teaching a lesson. The father in this parable is our father in heaven. And Jesus is telling us how our father in heaven acts when that which is lost becomes found. 
Our father was overcome with compassion and he ran to his son and showered with him with affection. But the lesson is so powerful that it doesn't stop there. And again, there's another read between the line moment because not only did the father show compassion and mercy and grace to the son, but then the father was quick to restore the son's position in the family. As the son came and he started to go over this pre-planned Script, Father, I've sinned against heaven and I've sinned against earth and I've sinned against you and I'm no longer worthy to be called your son. The father interrupts him and says, quick, get a robe, get a ring, put sandals on his feet, kill that big calf that we, we, we've been waiting for something special to happen because my son was lost and now he's found. He was dead, but now he's alive. And he quickly restored him to his place at the table. That's a powerful lesson to the people in the room that have spent their whole life putting them first. That's a powerful lesson to hear that the father was looking and the father had compassion and the father restored that which was lost and that which was broken. The first and most powerful lesson that Jesus wanted everyone in that room to hear was that the lost mattered and that the lost were worthy of being found. Jesus then turns his attention to the Pharisees in the room. That's part one of the lesson and there's a lot there to unpack. But part two is equally as powerful and equally as life-changing. The Pharisees just heard that the Father extends mercy and the Father extends grace and that the loss mattered. And that lesson was still ringing in their ears when Jesus then doubled down on this next part. He turned his attention to the Pharisees in the room because there was another lesson to be learned. We're gonna pick it up in verse 25. Meanwhile, okay, so all this is taking place. There's a celebration, the fattened calf has been killed, there's a robe, there's a ring, there's sandals on his feet. Meanwhile, the older son was in the field, okay? Remember, this this man had two sons. One took the inheritance and split and blew it. We call him the prodigal, okay, the lost son. The other son was home. He was out in the field, he was working. The older son, meanwhile, the older son was in the field. When he came near the house, he heard music and dancing. So he called one of the servants and asked him, what's going on? The servant said, your brother has come, he replied, and your father has killed the fattened calf because he has him back safe and sound. Verse 28, 28, the older brother became angry and refused to go in. What does he refuse to go into the celebration? There's a celebration taking place. The older brother now is angry because of the grace and the mercy and he refuses to go in. But check this out. The father came out of his own celebration and pleaded with him. But he answered the father, look, all these years I've been slaving for you and never disobeyed your orders. Yet you never even gave me a young goat so I could celebrate with my friends. But with this son of yours, Keep that in the back of your mind. We're gonna circle around to that. When this son of yours has squandered your property with prostitutes, when he comes home, you kill the fattened calf for him. The father answers in verse 31, my son, you are always with me and everything I have is yours. But we had to celebrate and be glad because this brother of yours was dead and is alive again. He was lost, but now he is found. Write this down, our second and final point of the morning for number two. The father's favor is freely given. That's the lesson that the Pharisees in the room needed to hear that day. That's the reason that when Jesus is talking about the older brother, that the older brother looks exactly like the Pharisees did. 
The other brother was living life and had the same thought process as the, as the Pharisees in the room that day. And this is why Jesus is driving this point home. The father's favor is freely given. There were so many read between the line opportunities there. And I just want to pull a couple of them out. If you still have your Bible open, look at verse 25. It tells us that the older son is out in the field. What happens in the field? Work. The older son is out working. The younger son is out blowing money and spending it on wild living and doing whatever he wanted to do and, and blowing dad's inheritance. But the older one, he doesn't do that. He's faithful. He's obedient. He's out in the field. He's doing what the father is asking him to do. Work. And then when he approaches the house, another lesson, he hears music and he hears dancing and he sees that there's a party going on and he has zero idea what's happening. Why? Because he's been in the field working. He's not a part of what's happening at home. He's too busy building this resume, too busy marking the boxes and checking the list, right? He's taking care of business. Why? Because in his mind, that's the way to earn the father's favor. So he has, he has to ask somebody, what in the world's going on? Oh, your younger, you didn't hear? Your younger brother came home. Your dad, man, he put a robe on him, put a ring on him. Your dad forgave him. We're having a party because he's home. And this blows the older son's mind. He is so angry because he's got this unhealthy sense of grace and favor and mercy. He doesn't understand it. In fact, in his mind, God's mercy, the father's mercy, the father's favor, the father's grace needs to be earned. And there is absolutely no way you can convince him that that younger brother earned it. In fact, he had such a, a bad taste in his mouth about the, the younger brother that I don't know if you caught it or not, but he, he wouldn't even call him family. He said, this son of yours comes home after blowing all of your money and you wanna throw a party for him? He couldn't even call him a brother this, this son of yours comes home and you want to throw a party for him. It was hard for him to wrap his head around what was taking place. And so he actually like refused to go into the party. For the very first time in the Pharisee's life, the older brother's life, he's being disobedient to the father because the father is throwing a party and he refuses to go in. Why? Because if you're not going to stand up for what's right and what's wrong, I'll stand up for what's right and what's wrong. But the truth of the matter is, is that the older son isn't going into the party, not for justice. It's his own sin that's keeping him outside. His own pride, his own arrogance, his own self-righteousness. He doesn't believe that the younger brother is worthy of the father's favor. Circle back around to who's in the room. The Pharisees lived their whole life checking boxes. What are they doing when they're checking boxes? What are they doing when they're memorizing scripture? What are they doing when they live life to the law? They're building a resume. The Pharisees absolutely believed that you had to earn your way to heaven. And in their opinion, they were doing a really, really good job of earning it and nobody else was. They had an unhealthy sense of grace and mercy because they did not believe that Christ gave it freely. They believed that you had to once again work for it and earn it. And they 100% did not look at everyone as their brother and sister in Christ. Only those that look like them were going to be able to spend eternity in heaven. So they disassociated themselves with God's family. And that is the lesson that Jesus is driving home. He's speaking directly to him, to them. You know what um, legalism is? I heard this the other day, it's not mine, uh, but in studying for this, it, it really stood out. Legalism, some people think that legalism is, is when, it, when it comes to your, your faith in God and following God. A lot of people think that legalism is reading the scriptures and obeying them to a T, right? 
Oh, legalism is when you read the scripture, you know the scripture, you study the scripture, you know what God's asking, and then you're, you're just a rule follower. That's being legalistic. But that has nothing to do with legalism. Legalism is when we read the scriptures, we add to the scriptures something that isn't there, something of our own doing, and then we require other people to live up to that standard in order, in order to meet the, the mark. And that's exactly what the Pharisees were doing. They were adding things to the scripture. If you wanna follow God, if you wanna go to heaven, if you wanna be one of his followers, you have to do A, B, C, and D. And when Jesus came, he was like, no, you don't. You don't have to earn anything. You don't have to work your way there. In fact, it is all given freely. It's all because of me and what I can give you. And that is why the Pharisees hated them. That's why they called him a lunatic and that's why they called him a liar. The oldest son was lost. He looked down on others because of his own self-righteousness and his own obedience. Church, if we are doing things out of a legalistic obedience, trying to please the Lord with our works, trying to check the boxes, trying to build a resume, we'll end up looking at others who do not meet our standards the exact same way that the older son looked at his younger brother. And that is unacceptable. Two major life lessons that Jesus taught the folks in the room that day. The father was looking because the lost matter. And that God's grace, the Father's favor, is given freely. And there's nothing that we can do to earn that. So Jesus leaves the parable open-ended. And I believe that he he leaves it open-ended on purpose. We don't know if the older brother responded. We don't know if he had a change of heart. We don't know if he humbled himself and came into the banquet. Jesus left the parable open because I believe that he was challenging the Pharisees in the room that day to finish the story for themselves. I think he was challenging them to look at grace differently. Will you accept the mercy of the Father? Will you humble yourself and realize that it's never been about you and what you do, it's always been about a gracious Father? I heard something um, and it really stuck with me. Somebody said something along the lines of um, that they think that this parable um, has been misnamed. It's always been known uh, the parable of the prodigal son or the parable of the lost son, right? But they they said, um, they think that a better name for this parable is the parable of the gracious father because the father in this story is the hero. The father in this story is the one who saw that something was lost and continued to keep looking for him instead of just writing it off. Well, I still have 99 sheep. Why do I need to go find the one? I still have have nine good coins. Why do I need to search the house to find the one lost one? I still have one son that obeys and respects and does what I'm asking. Why do I need to keep my eye out and keep looking for the one that's lost? The gracious father, that's a powerful parable that shows us firsthand God's love and mercy and favor and grace and how he will continue to keep looking for you no matter how far gone you are and how he will continue to keep begging you to come and have that relationship. Did you notice the story in the story when when the brother threw a fit and said, "I, I refuse to go to the party, I'm staying outside? The father left his own party that he's throwing, which would have been a huge no-no in those days, and everyone in the room would have been able to assume that. Oh, wait, wait, what? He's throwing a banquet and he left it? Yeah, the father once again left the banquet to go out and talk to the son who's throwing himself a pity party outside, and he begs him to come inside. Will you please reconsider? Will you please have a change of heart? Will you please have relationship with me? Will you submit? Will you humble yourself? So as we wrap up, 
What's the point? What's the lesson? What's your takeaway? I guess the takeaway is this. Who do you relate to the most in the story? And then are you willing to take the lesson that was taught to that in particular party and apply it to your own life? Are you the son that left home because you made decisions or are making decisions that go directly against what the father is asking? Do you find yourself desperate and lost and broke spiritually, maybe even physically? Do you find yourself regretting your choices? Are you wondering if it's so far gone, if so much time has passed, if it's, if it's too little, too late? Are you wondering if the Father is still looking for you? If, if you relate to that side of this parable, can I, just, can I just encourage you? The Father is looking and has never stopped looking. And if you would just humble yourself and submit and repent of your sins, that's, that's what the son did when he came back. Father, I've sinned against heaven and against earth. I've sinned against you and only you. I'm not even worthy to be called your son. Will you forgive me? That's repentance. Repentance is when we stop doing what we're doing and we turn and we go the other way. And when you repent, the lesson for you today is the Father is always looking and will always forgive and will always restore and will always celebrate your return when you have that repenting heart. So maybe you needed to hear that side of the story today. And if that's the case, I'm so glad you're here. And I hope and pray that the Holy Spirit is poking at you right now and letting you know in, in, in no uncertain terms that your father is excited and wants you to come home. And maybe you relate to the older son. Maybe subconsciously, without even knowing it, you've kind of started to live a life with this, with God and your father and your relationship where all of a sudden you kind of feel like you start to have it all figured out, right? I go to church on Sunday morning, I volunteer, uh, I give a, a portion of, uh, of, of my finances to the church. I'm going to VBS next week and gonna be dealing with those kids for five days in a row. There's gotta be some kind of brownie points there, right? You, you, you start to kind of think, I got this thing figured out. You know, I quit these bad habits and, 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 and I do better, I, I I do more right than I do more wrong. And, and, and you're starting to kind of subconsciously maybe look at other people and, and, and go, well, I'm better than that guy, so therefore I deserve more favor than that guy. I deserve, I deserve more of God's, he should love me. I don't know about you, but I've built resumes before, spiritual resumes. And I didn't even realize I was building it until all of a sudden some tragedy in my life happened. And then I started reciting everything on that resume. <laughs> God, I've devoted my life to serving you. I teach kids about your love. I've been faithful to the church. I've been faithful to my wife. I've been a good dad. I've done everything you've asked of me. Why is this happening now? I'm reciting this resume. Maybe Maybe the lesson that you needed to hear today is, it's never been about you. It's never been about what you bring to the table. It's always been about a father who gives freely. And maybe you just need to re-rack and humble yourself. And almost just kind of ask for that fresh start of that do-over. So, where do you fall? Who do you relate to? What lesson do you need to apply to your life today? Maybe the lesson you needed to hear today was just the lesson of a, the gracious father. And you just needed to be reminded that our father's mercy is incredible. That his grace knows no bounds and that he will constantly go the extra mile 
to show you time and time and time again how much he loves you. Will you bow your heads with me? Lord Jesus, thank you so much for an opportunity today to open up your word, look at these lessons that were, that you gave thousands of years ago, but are still fresh and relevant and applied to our life today. Father, I pray for each and every person in the room. Lord, if they need to have a moment with you, I pray they have a moment with you. No matter what direction they're going, Maybe it's that prodigal son that's saying, will you forgive me? Maybe it's that older son that needs to lay that resume down and to not work so hard to check the boxes. Whatever it is, Father, I pray your Holy Spirit meets them right where they are and that they have a real, honest, fresh conversation with you. And that when they walk out of here or when they wake up tomorrow, when they begin their new week, they've got a fresh pep in their step and their shoulders are back and their heads up because they were able to have that honest self-inventory and that your Holy Spirit gave them what they needed. Lord, that's what I pray. Father, thank you so much for what you're doing in the life of this church. Thank you so much for what you're doing in our lives as individuals. Father, we love you. We thank you. Uh, And I just pray that you will give us all a safe and great week and bring us back next week as we continue on in this parable series uh, this summer. Father, we love you. We ask these things in your name. Amen. Hey, thanks for checking in with us today. We hope that the message was inspiring and encouraging for you to take at least one step closer to Jesus. Hey, if you haven't hit that subscribe button yet, go ahead and do that. That way you can keep up with what's happening around here at New Life. You can also check out our website at newlifecc.com. If you ever want us to pray with you or you want to support what's happening here at New Life, you can do that on our website as well. Again, thanks for watching. We'll see you next time.